Mrs. Clara Knopfler puts life back into the tragic Holocaust. In 1944, she was taken from her home in Transylvania and later separated from her father and brother at Auschwitz, only to be placed in work camps, where she submitted to grueling labor, inhumane treatment, and hard living conditions. Even after the war and the liberation of the Jews, life was not easy. Her and her mother were the sole survivors of their family and were forced to create a new home and life wherever possible. Despite these incredible hardships, Mrs. Knopfler never failed to seek opportunity and find hope in a world that for years provided her with pain and subjected her to extreme inhumanity. After the Holocaust, she chose to take action and recognizing the importance of education, she finished her schooling and became a teacher. It's an extraordinary one at that. I had the immense honor of accompanying Mrs. Knopfler to a lecture she conducted at Angela Petrie Middle School in the Bronx. Her words of hope, resilience, and the grim reality she told brought tears to the eyes of many students in attendance. Afterwards, students and faculty alike showered Mrs. Knopfler with hugs, encouragement, and unyielding gratitude for sharing her story with them. It is clear that Mrs. Knopfler is an inspiration to all of those who have the honor of meeting her. She is a true activist and teacher, but most importantly, she is the archetype of a strong, sincere, genuine woman. As you are watching this film, I encourage you to keep in mind that Mrs. Knopfler is more than simply a Holocaust survivor. Prior to the Nazi invasion, she is a woman who had hopes, dreams, and aspirations just as you and I. And as an educator, she understands the importance of words and stories and continues to tell her own story to ensure that no one forgets the Holocaust. She is intelligent, caring, and against all odds, optimistic. As you are watching and listening to her story, I encourage you to not allow this film to die or be filed away in the back of your minds. Instead, I challenge you to use this as a jumping off point to fight against the current injustices that continue today. From Bosnia to Rwanda to the current crisis in Darfur, genocide did not end after World War II, and sadly, it is very much alive today. Do not simply hear Mrs. Knopfler's words, but listen to her stories and watch her inflections and see her as the woman who could have easily been your high school French teacher. And remember, the Holocaust is more than just textbook history. It is a tragic event in human history that must be remembered to ensure that we never allow genocide or acts against humanity to happen again. So I was born in Romania, but we always spoke two or three languages, Romanian and Hungarian. And really, it, I had a happy childhood till I was 13 years old. There was no difference between Christians and Jews. My friends were majority Christians. There were fewer Jews than the um, Christian population. And I had really no problem. I didn't feel anti-Semitism in my childhood. I had a brother, my small family brother, myself, mom, and my father, the small family. But my father had 11 siblings. My mother had five, four, four uh, brothers, and she was the only daughter. And life was somewhat without problem. When in 1940, the Germans signed Hungary to, uh, to uh, Transylvania to Hungary, and unfortunately, that was uh, our trouble, because all the laws that the Germans used against the Jews in Germany and Poland, they were in the war already, was applied to us that was completely hidden from us. Nobody knew. Um, really, secrecy was their weapon. 
because we never knew from one hour to another what's going to happen. The biggest blow was for us children that as soon as the Hitler's law entered in Hunger in Transylvania, children have no schools. We called it numerus nullus, no number. Because there was a numerous clauses before, which was 2% of a class could be Jewish, the rest not. Then after 1940, the first blow, they came in uh, June or May, I'm not so sure, when they occupied my little town, which was Czechoslovakia in Transylvania. Um, the first one of the first laws, no school for children. It was already a vacation. So we didn't know what would happen to us. A teacher who was prominent at that time, a mathematician known in Europe, and the rabbi of that community, went to the highest level of the mayor. And they said, our children need school. We cannot leave them on the streets. And based on that professor's merits, they got the permission to have a private school. And of course, boys separately and girls separately. And uh, we, they founded a school, accredited. But it was under the supervision of the Hungarian government and education department. And we had to have much more than the other children. We had to prove that it's worthwhile to have a school for us. Um, it, wasn't, it was only in one city of um, Transylvania. So I had to go to that city, which is Kolozsvár. I had to go and uh, live with my aunt, and my brother lived with another boarding school. So it was very difficult for my parents, especially that they took away the business from us. So they worked by themselves. He made manufactured shoes that he never did before. And we had a, also a, a, a store for a um, shoe store. They took it away. So they, whatever they could afford, they paid for this private school. Everybody according his means we sustained the schools. And the teachers were those who were kicked out from public schools because they were Jewish. So we had the creme de la creme of, of people who uh, teachers with doctorate and from universities and, you know, and they taught our middle school and high school. Unfortunately, this school lasted four years because in 1944, we were taken to Auschwitz. Now, this is our life before the war. I was a happy child, happy child. I had no problem with, it's possible, coexistence is possible, but we have to fight for it. <clears throat> and, and then when did you first encounter anti-Semitism towards um, you or your family in Transylvania? Well, the minute this law started, then we knew already that there are people who didn't talk to us. My friends, they tried, but they showed, uh, they were looking at a small town, everybody knew everybody. So when we started to talk, they went around and saw, this is like a leprous. And my friends, Christian friends could not understand what's going on. We don't play tennis anymore together. We don't go to school anymore. So we saw that who is who. Some people were for us and tried to, later on I will tell you the story you read my book, that I know who was my friend because they kept waiting for me and they hoped to come wherever I was. They didn't know, but they waited for us. The other group, already turned their back to us. And we didn't know why, because I was blonde or brown. 
Later on, we slowly we found that another law that came across, you no know, Jewish people can go to a movie, no um, restaurant, we couldn't inter interact with our... Then we saw, not so slowly, by 1944 everybody knew that whoever is a Jew is a bad guy. And, and we were isolated, like par, paria, you could pronounce it, like parias, you know, people who are left alone and, and have to be isolated. So uh, this lasted from 1940 to 1944, increased anti-Semitism. Uh, it grew. Uh, nobody knew what will happen because there were rumors that we were taken out of country, uh, not out of country, we will be taken to factories to work and to farms because the men are on the fr in the front fighting Hitler's war. But we really didn't know anything until 1944, March, when a German government, German supervised government came to a lead Hungary, and then they sent us home from school in the middle of March, right after the uh, Christmas vacation. Yeah, uh, in March they sent us home from school and they said no more school. And my father told us that uh, probably we will go somewhere we don't know where because there are rumors. We had books in the attic, Russian. Tolstoy, Chekhov, um, Turgenev, we had in the attic because it was forbidden to read them. And we had in the attic, I said, why, don't, why do we keep it there? I said, because they don't like the Russians and they are a lot of uh, problems, but we had to know about them. She, he taught me every, from every uh, Italian, uh, French, uh, German songs in the original. She said, at least two you have to know from each composer who wrote in German that, and you see that saved my life. That was his idea. You never forget what you get at home. Education, everything what is in your head, nobody can take it away. There are other people who said this, but for me, my father was the first. So study, study, study. And we should suddenly heard that we have to leave the, uh, the house when they don't know, but half an hour before. They told us to pack as much as we can take, like a blanket, because we went some, we will go somewhere, they will work, either in farms, they didn't tell us that this would be a ghetto and what happened. So in half an hour, we had to get ready and leave the house. Uh, they took everything from us, valuables, gold. They want to take off my mom's wedding ring because she somehow didn't hand in without receipt. Uh, he didn't, she didn't hand in. And the sergeant, you know, uh, it's not really a soldier, it's like a policeman, they were. And she saw the ring on her finger and she said, you have a gold ring, your wedding ring is there. So my mother said, yes, this is 20 years of marriage. And she started to protect her, to defend herself. They said, you don't need the ring anymore, you don't have a husband anymore, you won't have a house anymore. You know, she talking something, pulled off the ring, put it in his pocket, and that was it. Now, you picture yourself and a child sees this. By that time, I was 16 years old, close to 17, and um, it hurts. So, nothing to do, they took us to the, the only station of the train station, they packed us in, and they took us to a ghetto. And that was May the 3rd. These days are very bad for me. I still remember everything. And we lived near each other in the tent because we lived in a brick factory in the ghetto that had no walls. The bricks were taken out and we slept on the floor. 
with the blankets that we brought from home and pillows. Sixteen in a row. Not only our family, but who are, who are related to us. And this, start, and this lasted only three weeks uh, in the ghetto, because by June, the first June, we were taken to Auschwitz. And um, where did you go next after the ghetto? Auschwitz. Uh, we didn't know that we went out, mm -hmm. when got out from the country, but the third day they saw, my, uh, my, my father saw, you know, they, these were cattle wagons, it's called cattle car, mm -hmm. that took us to Auschwitz. And they had no windows, only that window where the horse could look out. So my father saw that the nature is changing. It's, this is not Hungary anymore. And we realized that we are out of the country. And by the fourth day at night, we arrived to Auschwitz. And I saw it in Auschwitz, I spoke German, and I asked the guy uh, uh, who opened the doors, because the doors were not open only for the, for the uh, cans, like garbage cans. That's where we did number one and two, the ghetto, in, in the uh, cattle car. Mm -hmm. And so he looked out and he said, this is not what I see. I said, what is this town? So the guard says to me, Auschwitz, you will never forget. You will never forget this name. And that they took us off. My grandmother was sick. I don't know what happened to her. Later on, we found out what happened. Left, right, left. When the health, first they separated men from women. My father went with my brother. Then they separated the women. Healthy good-looking, working women, that from 16, if you are well developed by 16, you would push, push to the right because you can work for the Germans. That was the purpose. And to the left, old people or young mother with children, they went directly to death chambers. We didn't know. I found out everything when I came home. I had no idea where my father was, what happened to my grandmother, slowly, when we came home and met other prisoners who were freed, were liberated, they took us the gas chambers. There was some sign. We saw uh, the crematorium and, and the smoke. And my aunt mother said, you know what is this? I said, I don't know. This is a crematorium. Probably they don't have cemeteries here, so somebody dies, they will put in crematorium. We didn't know that first they were gassed and then put in crematorium. There were three or four in Auschwitz, but we were lucky there because we were only eight days in Auschwitz. They grabbed on us, finally, workers to supply gunpowder factory, anti-tank trenches, that's what we did. So, so they grabbed on us and they, we were selected to take us somewhere else. And what was for us very difficult is that we were put in a, a workplace where we manufactured, recycled old batteries. If you recycle, we open the battery, we cut it with a knife, Inside, there is a stuff, uh, I don't know if you have seen, if you open, it's like a powder, but it's um, sticky. And that is the base of the gunpowder that they manufactured in the other building. So our work was very important. We manufactured or recycled batteries. But the problem was that it was from 6 o'clock at night till six o'clock in the morning, two shifts. And picture yourself, even though you're older. Do you like to work from six o'clock? By 12 o'clock, when Riga was dark, because it wasn't um, at eight o'clock dark, you know? At 12 o'clock became dark. 
Then our heads fell on the table where we were, 60 in a room like this, 60 we were, in tables. And they had to beat up some people to work. This guy, and I stop here, not all SS were bad. They had human feelings. They were, how shall I say, impregnated and, and, and misled and brainwashed by Hitler's idiosyncrasy, who preached we are animals, dispensable. As long as we work, we do some work for them. Otherwise, we don't have to live. So this guy, one night, and he had to beat up with four women, or the four women, he was the foreman. And he said, you little girl, come here to me. You know how I prayed, of course. You speak German. You must sing German also. I said, I know one or two songs in German. My father was a singer. He taught me uh, an Italian melody in Italian, too. French in French. German, Mozart, Schubert in German. Lehar. So I said, those are, those are the two songs that I know. Never mind. At 12 o'clock, when you see that everybody is getting to sleep, sleepy, you start the tune and start in German and sing. So the same day at 12 o'clock I started to sing and he was right. Everybody knew the melody and they sang along. We wanted to forget where are we. And he never beat up everybody anymore. He saved us from being beaten up and he produced. I mean, we started to get used to it and produce. Now, this is an example that one man can make a difference. He saved his position and us. I got to be friendly with a mechanic, also Jewish, who came to fix our machines if something was broken. And one day he came to me and he said, watch out, tomorrow will be a selection. I didn't know yet what the selection purpose is, taking you away. But I saw ships in the harbor and that's for you. Ships for us is merchandise ships, but I saw them. And he brought me a piece of red paper to put some red on my mom's face. My mom was already paired, she lost weight, she couldn't eat that food. That was terrible in Riga. So she said, put some uh, red on her face, she's very fair. She, he brought me a, a little, uh, like a scarf, I don't know where did he take from. And I cut also a piece from my dress mom because we were all shaven in Auschwitz uh, and he said watch out don't stay together with your mother because they want you to be far from each other they don't want they, they love you know to separate mother and I looked like my mother sometimes so next day he was right two SS men came and we stand all cold five people in a row and got to my mother. She was older than the others. We were all young people. And she said, how old are you? The art mister. So my mom lied and she said, 39. He was furious. He said, you see, you want to die? You don't want to work anymore for us? We need people. You are not 31. Look at her legs. My mom had beautiful legs. Lifted her dress. The, the, the prisoner dress, lifted, said, look at her, to the other, look at her feet, her legs, she's strong, go back to the room and stay there, we need you. This is how I saved the second time my mother. This guy helped me, this was a Jewish guy, he saw his people 
shot in Hamburg. He was a third year engineer when he was taken to Gap. But he was very skillful. He was a mechanic and they used him. He took the, shot, the leader to Riga if he had to. So he was a chauffeur, but he knew a lot. So I'm grateful. It's in the book. I, I, I write about it. That was Riga. After that, the ship took us to another place, Stutthof. And they separated again. And then they took us to dig uh, anti-tank uh, trenches against the Russian tanks. That was the uh, very, very serious work. And they relied on us because they thought that the Russian tanks, the whole field was crisscrossed with this kind of three, six yards wide, six yards deep, it's like a trapeze, and that was an anti-tank trench. So the Russians will just get, so we could, they couldn't get through the tanks, they would just be killed. They went on the other side, <laughs> not where the trenches were. So, But we spent from, um, I would say from August, at the end of August, September, October, November, December, January, we spent digging and trenches. And we were supervised by 16 years old boys. Uh, it was like a, a war demanded uh, work from them. They are called Hitler Jugend. The youth, it's like Boy Scout or something like this, but they had to work with uh, prisoners who were digging the anti tank trenches. And he had a kind of baseball uh, bat in his hand. He didn't have a, a weapon, but he went around and hit the people to work faster. The war is uh, worse, and the Russians are coming. And he stopped at my mother, and he started, started to hit her, that you are slow like a louse, and, and yelling at her and hitting her. I was in the bottom of the trench. And I heard, you are an old bag, and you don't work fast enough, and, and we feed you. I said, whatever happens to me, I don't care, I have to stop this. So I got out from the trench and I confronted him. I said, stop that. Don't hit this woman who is working for you from 8 o'clock till sunset with the food that you are giving to him. Uh, I don't want to tell you what else did I say, but I said, stop it. You don't have a mother? This is my mother. You know, he was flabbergasted. He was a 16 years old youngster who in his group was brainwashed. You hit the Jew if she doesn't work. You know. But he was red and he answered after a while, I have a mother, but she's German. He turned around and left, but he stopped beating my mother, left. You can imagine that all the others who worked in the same group with me, you are crazy Clara now, he will call the SS because the guards were SS and they could punish you and who knows what can happen to you. So I didn't care, you know, especially at night when I saw my mom, the bruises in her back. Whatever will happen, I don't care when I stop the meeting. This guy, next day, about lunchtime, he came back directly to the group where I was working with a carrot, half of a cigarette, and he said, eat this carrot. Um, it has some vitamin in it. Smoke this cigarette. You will be less hungry. I was plenty hungry after that. But the fact that he came back with uh, apologizing what he did the day before and trying to help me to, to 
save a couple of moments in my life. He left, but he gave me a, again a sparkle of hope that not everybody hates us, not everybody wants to kill us. We are not quite animals. So, uh, my mother got better and we were all frozen already. And by January, by, by Christmas time, um, it was a holiday for the German guards and the leaders. For us, it wasn't. But that night, we went out, a couple of women, to uh, beg. It was a little village next to our workplace, tents. And the people gave us a little food, a little bread. But one of them, when we returned, we, when we figured that the, they had the dinner already, because they sneaked out, and was caught, one of us. And they found her, they poured cold water on her. It was freezing, December 25. I know that she survived, but can you imagine Christmas night to kill, almost kill a woman like this? She's frozen all her legs. They did not consider us women. They could not start any kind of uh, sexual advancement because the, the German guards would be put, punished, not by that, but they would be sent to the front or whatever. But. Uh, they did not consider us women. They consider us animals who have to work. No uh, conversation of any kind of, I am not talking about intellectual uh, conversation, but work, do this, do that, hitting, no difference. They consider us animals. I'm telling you, if those who didn't, I cherish them. In my book, I showed that as an example, that not every German SS was bad. There were some who were human. When we were told that now we have to evacuate the camp because it's cold, it, it, they can, the Russians are coming, and the, the, they cannot, uh, uh, we cannot dig anymore uh, the trenches because it, well, the soil was frozen. We stood in line to have another selection. I didn't think that my mother would survive that. It was January 19th on my birthday. I have my mother say, Clara, it's your birthday. I have a birthday present for you. Birthday present in, in the concentration camp. She has a little newspaper, newspaper, back at some worker left it in, in the trench and packed in and I opened. There were three slices of bread with margarine in between. She made a layer cake. She said, this is your birthday cake. I hope next year, I was 18 that time, uh, next year I will give you a real one. And I looked at her and said, mom, where did you get the bread? Three slices of bread. We had one slice a day. She said, evasive, she said, you didn't eat last night your bread. I said, Mom, I didn't eat my bread. I could eat the stone. I was so hungry all the time. She didn't eat for three days so she can make a layer cake for me. That's a mother. A mother who had no role in concentration camp because she couldn't be a mother. She was happy when she took my, my only dress to the river and washed it while I was under the blanket. But she did that for me. So we were selected to go. After two days of walking that we call death march because whoever could not make it was shut on the road. We got to a farm where the Germans or Polish, we are not sure, left. And they put us in, most of the people, we were about 250 out of 1,000 who could walk. 
in a, a stable where was straw and some of us who spoke German and could cook something and help the SS uh, guards, uh, they took us in the kitchen, in the farm. And we overheard the meeting, I did, because I spoke German, and some other people also. What shall we do with these people here? One guard said, let's uh, burn them. It's enough straw in there. Uh, in the stable. This old German said, guy, or we called him Papa because he had a good heart, and he said, no, the whole region will stink of their flesh. So another said, let's shoot them. Again, the old guy said, are you crazy? I should use my bullets for them. I want to protect myself if the Russians come. We don't know what happened but because we went to sleep. Next day at four o'clock, somebody woke up to go up out. They were gone. We were free in the middle of nowhere. And we waited for the next Russian guy who came in, the first guy on my motorcycle. He was ugly, he was unshaved. We all hugged him. And he didn't know where the skeletons, we were all skeletons. Lost weight, my mother was 180 pounds when we left, she was tall, nice woman. She was 93 when we were liberated. We don't know the pound, but we know that when we came home. So anyway, we were in the middle of nowhere. It took us three months walking home mostly from East Prussia to now back Romania, because Romania became, uh, Transylvania went back to Romanians in 1945. And it took us three months to walk home. These are stories, you know, that come back and back. You can't forget them. When I came home in that town where I lived, I found an empty house. They didn't take my, my piano, it was too heavy, but they emptied it, looted. And second day when finally we looked around, a friend of mine comes over with a velvet dress, blue velvet dress, my sweet 16 dress, a nice lace color. She pulled off from the truck, it's a risk, you know, it's about whiskey, pulled off the dress because Clara will come back. And when I came back, she didn't know where from, she brought my sweet sixteen dress. She put, she put the dress among her dresses and waited for me. Another boy saved my accordion the same way. He put the accordion three months in the ground. And when I came back, he brought it to me. The box was in chambers. But he saved my accordion. Now these are friends, Christian friends. Is it possible, the coexistence? It is. But you have to take a risk and you have to, and I, what I teach them, be alert. Find out who is right and who is wrong. Don't be a bystander, be an upstander. So then my mother started to work in a, uh, it's like a, a hardware store a sales lady and I went to work as a clerk in the town hall and there instead of getting money I got food coupons uh, petroleum that was um, for light because we don't have, we have electricity in that town and it was a great help and in between I finished my sophomore year, my junior year, and in August I was finished with for two years, and in September I went to my senior year to the same town where I was before in a Jewish school. So this built me up. The population, or the population generally, was good in that town, because they, they lived Jews, Romanian, Hungarian lived in the same town. 
I cannot say that it was, everybody was so good when we left. They turned down their shades on the window so they would not see how we were taken away to the train with baggages. But uh, mostly when I came home, my Christian friends gave me hope that I can make it and continue my life. I must tell that, that I have very good uh, memories of how I was received. One of the teachers who was a guidance teacher, his name was Zubak, this, I taught in East Chester, you know, and um, he told me, Clara, you survived the war. I don't know where and how, but talk about it. No, I, I still have nightmares. No, start to talk about it. You will have less nightmares. And he was right. So he said first to my principal, and the principal called together the faculty, if the history teachers, the, the English teachers, want to hear about my Holocaust experiences, they should come. We were about 30, 35 teachers in our faculty. And they all pushed me to talk to the students. This is, it's here where it started. In Romania, my friends didn't want to hear about it. When I came in the United States, my uncle said, don't talk about my mother's death. Don't talk about the, the uh, aunt's, uncles. You know, 37 members of my family died there. Don't talk about it, it's bad for you. They didn't want to hear. It took me from 1962 when I arrived till 70 something, I am not sure, when I started to teach in East Chester. And then the word got out and they invited me to Yonkers and they invited me to speak about it. And then suddenly other survivors came up that we had to talk about. This motivated me to be a teacher to teach not only French and Latin, because somehow a human, a, a teacher who is human and, and talks about other things, not just French, what my subject was, I gave uh, maybe more to my students than with a new language. Maybe more. More standard human feelings, helping, those are generosity, modesty in the same time, in the sense that you don't have to have 100 pair of shoes to be happy. You can be a little more modest and appreciate little things in life because those count in your lifestyle and your well-being, little things. So it's a strive, it's a it's a, something that keeps you alive and keeps you going on. Many things, look, it's moving. I will get over somehow. I don't know how, but I will. These are not that important. It's more important that a child to smile, smile at you. Mrs. Laughlin, I'm glad you survived. You can tell your stories. You know, those 2,000 letters talk that I will publish. I will publish so that people should know that we have to take care of each other, we have to coexist together, we have to survive together. This is a big thing. Why do you think that I do this with my accent, with my uh, difficulties of expressing exactly what I want to tell you? Because it's a mission. It's something that I want to teach the world not preach, teach, that see, they are innocent people. Look at these bombs that they contain, the suicide bombs. They kill themselves and they kill 20 other people in Iraq, in Israel, in Darfur. They still don't listen. They still don't, we, we are here, as long as I'm here, I'm going to try to change the world. Promise me, never forget us, and we will fight against the with you.
a little help. I don't know if you can farm the city, but whatever you can, education, not violence, help people who are down, help people who hope to be better, and never give up because of your short, your long, your black, your white. You are you, and you have the time to live and go on.